the early 1990s, the nation was rocked by news of a female serial killer in Central Florida. The name Eileen Wernos became synonymous with deviant and evil. Her life has been immortalized in documentaries, books, in opera, and even the Hollywood film Monster. But the reality of Eileen Wernos's real life is a stark contrast to the glamour of Hollywood. From the outset, Eileen Lee Wernos lived an incredibly difficult life. She was born in 1956 in Rochester, Michigan to two teenage parents who separated before she was born. Her 16-year-old mother abandoned her and her older brother when she was just a baby. Her father, who she never knew, was sent to prison for kidnapping and raping a small child and would later kill himself there. Wernos was adopted by her maternal grandparents and was raised amongst her aunts and uncles as if they were her siblings unaware of the true relationship between her parents and siblings, until she was about 10 years old when she found out through schoolyard gossip. Her grandparents were reportedly very strict and alcoholics. Her grandfather was known to beat her and may have sexually abused her as well. Her brother, or uncle, would later dispute these claims, stating that she had a very normal childhood. As a young teen, her need for help was apparent. By age 13, Wernos was pregnant, which she said was the result of a rape. She was sent to live in a home for unwed mothers until she gave birth and put the baby up for adoption. A school report from 1970 stated that Wernos needed immediate counseling for her own welfare. Wernos became homeless and would soon drop out of school. She began to hitchhike around the country, finding odd jobs, including sex work, to provide for herself. By the mid-1970s, she made her way down to Florida and continued to provide for herself through sex work for years, but found herself in trouble with the law for other reasons. Her rap sheet included armed robbery, vehicle theft, grand larceny, and drunk driving. But in 1989, Wernos's actions took a drastic turn. On December 13th, 1989, the body of Richard Mallory was found in a wooded area in Volusia County, several miles from where his abandoned car was found nearly two weeks prior. Mallory had been shot several times, including two lethal blows to his left lung. He was just the first in a string of similar killings of middle-aged white men along Interstate 75 in Florida. The next man, David Spears, was found six months after Mallory in June of 1990 in Citrus County. He had been shot six times in the torso. Just a few days after that, Charles Karskaden was discovered in Pasco County with nine shots in his chest. The next body discovered was that of Troy Burress, found in Marin County in August. The body was in a decomposed state, but authorities were still able to determine that it had been shot twice. A month later, the body of Charles Humphreys was also found in Marion County, with six bullet holes in his head and torso. The last body found was that of Walter Antonio, found in Dixie County in November of 1990. He too had been shot in the head and the chest. There was believed to be a seventh victim, Peter Seams, but his body was never found. Only his abandoned car, found on July 4th, 1990, which would play a key part in identifying Wernos. To complicate things a bit, another killer, the Gainesville Ripper, was on the loose in the area. However, he mostly preferred female college students. By November 1990, the highway killings in Florida were finally thought to be linked. All of the victims were white men between the ages of 41 and 66, all shot with a 22 caliber gun. The bodies and cars were all found separately. Cash was taken from every victim, but their wallet and credit cards remained, leaving authorities to believe that robbery was not the chief motive. Authorities announced that they believed that one or more women could be responsible for the killings, which led to hundreds of tips about potential perpetrators. In December, authorities stated that they believed that two women were in some way connected to the killings, though not necessarily responsible for them. Authorities came to this conclusion after hearing from witnesses who saw two women driving the car belonging to Peter Symes when it lost control and crashed through a fence. When approached by witnesses and asked if they needed help, the women declined and drove away. However, the car was not destined to make it much further and was abandoned not too far down the road. Paramedics were called after the initial crash and found two women walking along the road. When questioned about the accident, the women denied any incident. Paramedics noted that the front of their clothes were wet, as if they had washed something off of them. The women then asked paramedics for directions to Daytona Beach before hitching a ride with a passing car. Bloodstains were later found in Seams' car, which could explain the need to wash off their clothes. From this incident, the police had descriptions of the two women, as well as sketches of them. They estimated that they were in their 20s or 30s, both white, one was taller at 5'9", with blonde hair and a possible tattoo of a heart on her arm. The other was described as stocky at 5'3", with dark hair. The shorter woman described was Tyra Moore, 
Warnos's living girlfriend of four and a half years that Warnos described as the love of my life. According to Moore, she and Warnos were watching TV on the night of December 1st, 1989, when Warnos told her that she had shot and killed a man that day. When the authorities publicly began to look for the woman in the sketches from the incident with Seam's car, Moore fled the state, leaving Warnos behind. After that, a tip came in from the composite sketches that identified Moore and a Cami Green. A search of local pawn shop records showed a Cami Green selling items belonging to the dead men. A thumbprint of the pawn shop ticket matched that of Warnos's. She was then arrested on January 9, 1991 for a concealed weapons charge from 1986. She was found asleep on an old car seat outside of a bar known as The Last Resort. Moore was also picked up by the police and cooperated when they wanted her to record Warnos confessing to the murders over the phone. Moore stayed at a hotel in Daytona Beach provided by the police for days and had 10 calls with Warnos that were all recorded. The tactic worked. On January 16th, Warnos confessed to the police and informed them that she worked alone seemingly in an effort to protect Moore, the love of her life. In her confession tape, Warno stated, It's like I'm thinking, you bastards, you're gonna hurt me. It was self-defense. It was like, hey man, I gotta shoot you because I think you're gonna kill me. All in all, Warnos confessed to killing seven men in self-defense. Interestingly, while in prison awaiting trial, Warnos, now 35 years old, was adopted by Arlene Prale and her husband, a born-again Christian couple. Wuornos only went to trial for the killing of Richard Mallory. Throughout, Wuornos maintained that she killed the men in self-defense after engaging in sex work. According to Wuornos, the men attacked her, which is when she defended herself using the gun that she bought recently after being beaten by clients for years. She noted that the robbery of the men's possessions was an afterthought. She stated that she never had the intention of killing anyone. The prosecution, however, made the case that Warnos initiated contact with these men in order to rob them, and that she killed them to prevent apprehension afterwards. They floated the narrative that Warnos posed as a stranded motorist to lure in her victims who stopped to help, sprung the nickname, the Damsel of Death. In the end, Warnos was convicted of first-degree murder in the case of Richard Mallory. Afterwards, she pleaded guilty to the murders of the other men, with the exception of Peter Seams. Because a body was never found, Warnos was never prosecuted for that case. After her sentencing on January 31st, 1992, in which she received six death sentences, Warnos began to berate the courtroom. Thank you, and um, obviously, I'll be up in heaven while y'all rot in hell. During her 10 years on death row, Warnos and her attorney filed several appeals, but months before her execution date, Warnos decided to drop her appeals and fire her lawyers, stating, There are six cases which had all been unanimously decided for in death, and of which I firmly agreed in with their final decision, since I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. There was considerable debate over Warnos's mental state, and Governor Jeb Bush even issued a stay on her execution in order for a mental exam to take place. But three separate psychiatrists all concluded that she was cognizant of her actions as well as her looming execution. Up until the late 1990s, the state of Florida still conducted executions via the electric chair, but in 2000 switched to lethal injection, which Warnos expressed relief about. Her last words as part of her final statement were, Yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock, and I'll be back, like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6, like the movie, big mothership and all, I'll be back, I'll be back. She declined a last meal and was given a cup of coffee instead. On the morning of October 9th, 2002, Eileen Warnos was executed by lethal injection at Florida State Prison and was pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m.